who's in charge here? Today has a very uh, interesting title. We're talking today about how you see yourself, but not in the way that we usually think about it. You know, usually when you talk to people about how they see themselves, you're talking about self-image, whether you have a good or bad or poor self-image. That's not what we're going to talk about today. We're not talking about whether your self-image is negative or positive. We're not talking about what your feelings are like. And you, we all live with feelings, and that's, you know, part of who you are as a person. You're a body, a soul, and a spirit. So you have feelings, and you have emotions. You have both negative and positive thoughts. But that's not the subject either. The subject is, as we talk about how you see yourself, we're talking about how you relate yourself to your view of the world. And then the impact that that has, how you see yourself in the world and your view of the world, as it relates to your time, your talents, and your treasures, this is sometimes called a worldview. But when we think about worldviews, usually people think about, well, whether you're in your philosophy, whether you're, you know, Christian, your worldview, or secular, or humanistic. And we're not going to talk about that today. That's another whole, you know, area that's important to know about. But we're not going to talk about humanistic worldviews or secular worldviews or Christian worldviews. We're going to see that our worldview is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle that kind of comes together in our lives as we grow up. And there are three different worldviews that are very, very radically different. Radically different. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. I would encourage you to bring a Bible or bring your uh, U-version um, Bible along. By the way, how many of you saw the, about the app that I posted? Uh, there's a fabulous, fabulous app. I'm going to tell you about it as long as you promise not to get it during church, okay? Just write it down. There's a fabulous soul-winning app. Fabulous. I mean, I can't say enough about it. If you have a smartphone... You should get this app on your smartphone. It's called God Tools. God Tools. It's free, okay, in the, either the, the iTunes App Store or Google Play Store. So you can get it for both Android and Apple iPhones. And what it is, it's got the, it's got the plan of salvation in 20 different languages. And it's all in, right in that one app. You don't have to. It, it all downloads. And, and I mean, it's fabulous. I read about it from my friend uh, Troy Wolbrink, Tammy and Troy Wolbrink. Tammy uh, Bauer, her father was the principal of the Harrisburg Christian School. Some of you remember Bob Bauer. Well, Tammy Bauer, Wolbrink, she and her husband Troy live in Orlando, Florida, and they work with Campus Crusade, now called Crew Ministries. And uh, he developed software to help put this thing into a whole bunch of languages. And he mentioned it in their missionary newsletter that I get, and uh, I downloaded it, and it's really good. I mean, it's super good. I mean, if you have, and here's where you could use it, all right? If you ever have a person who is interested, now they're not interested, you know, the Bible says don't cast your pearls before swine, so you should not, seriously, and that's what this metaphor means, you should not try to jam something down somebody's throat as far as your spiritual beliefs if they're not interested, okay? If they're not interested and you're trying to jam it down in the throat, you're wasting your time and you're maybe doing more harm than good. And by the way, I didn't plan to say any of this, but the Holy Spirit's in charge here, okay? I'm serious. I didn't, have, I didn't plan to say any of this at all. So don't cram it down somebody's throat. If they don't want to hear about the gospel or about God or Jesus or being saved or anything spiritual, you're waste, don't jam it down the throat. However, there are people who say, well, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, I'd like to know more about this, or what about this Jesus stuff or the Bible? If they have any interest at all, you can say to them, and this is what's, where this app is so cool, you can say, well, you know, I have an app that's free, and I could show it to you on my phone, or you could download it on your phone, and you could read all about it, and you could just see it for yourself at your own leisure, see? And what's so awesome about it is, you know, it just takes people right through, I mean, it's got, it's got, uh, well, you'll have to see it for yourself. It's really fabulous. I mean, it, I can't say enough about it because it has super, super great soul winning potential as well as just helping, there's, a, there's even a plan in there for how somebody that's a new believer can grow in their faith and what they need to do. So, I mean, it's really, really good. 
called God Tools, okay? God Tools, and it's, uh, as I said, free on the, uh, uh, both of the app stores. Ephesians chapter 2. Why, where would we get the idea of being a resident alien? A resident alien. All right, listen to this. Paul said to the believers at Ephesus, And you God has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. He said you were dead. I preached one time from that passage, and I preached a message called Dead Men Walking. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the children of disobedience. That's Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. Now, let me jump right into the worldviews for you because it'll make more sense as we get into it. it. What we're talking about is where your citizenship is. In fact, if you're still in Ephesians 2, me, go over to verse 19. There Paul says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are fellow citizens with the saints. And that word saint there has to do with believers. So you're fellow citizens. Now, what's your worldview? There are three worldviews that are radically different. And you are one of these. Every one of us is one of these. Let's talk about them quickly. Number one, the first worldview is a, that of a native. That of a native. Now, if you go over to Romans 12, that's just back a few pages from Ephesians. Romans chapter 12. And I, as I said, I encourage you to bring your Bible or bring, you know, your, uh, your U version or your tablet and look it up there. There's something about God's Word, seeing it for yourself and marking it that will help you later. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul said, I'm, I'm asking you, brothers, by God's mercy, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be squeezed, conformed, into the mold of this world. Don't be squeezed into the mold of the world system. That, that word world in Romans 12 is the word cosmos. And it's not talking about the planet, okay? In the Bible, it says don't be squeezed into the mold of the world. It isn't talking about the planet. It's talking about the people, the system, the world system. Now, the word cosmos, here's what it means. Cosmos means those who are neutral to or opposed to God. Those who are neutral to or opposed to God. Now, by the way, that's how everybody's born into the world. Did you, did you know that? People are not born into the world Christians. Nobody's born as a Christian. Nobody is born seeking God. The Bible says, all we like sheep have done what? Gone astray. We've turned everyone to their own way. The Bible says, as it is written in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, not one. So, people aren't born naturally seeking God. They are born either neutral to, watch this, or opposed to God. And in, Paul, in Paul's writings to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 2, he calls the, these people, he calls this condition the natural man. The way you and I are born naturally into the world, we're born as sinners into a sinful world. So that's who we mean by natives, okay? That's who we mean by the natives. The natives are the people who are in the world and they are part of the world system they're not maybe against God, they may not be atheists, but they're not, you know, they just kind of think if you want to have some religion, that's fine for you. But 
don't bother with me with it. I don't need it, see? Okay? Those are natives. Now, what's their worldview like? What's the worldview of the native? Well, this is, well, watch this. This is pretty interesting. Because the native, in his worldview, he says and believes that this world is all there is. See, the native believes that this world's it. Nothing else. It's kind of like the old preacher's joke that I used to tell years ago about the little boy that was upstairs in his bedroom, you know, and he had wood floors, and he's looking under the bed for something that, you know, he lost them on his many toys, and he sees all this stuff under the bed, dirt, dust, and he hollers down the steps to his mother, hey, mom, is it true that we come from dust and we're just going back to dust? She said, well, yeah, why do you ask? He said, you better get up here quick because underneath my bed someone's either coming or going. <laughs> now, by the way, that's, the, that's the, the worldview of the native says, this is it. This is all there is. And that's what a lot of people believe. Uh, and by the way, those people, that, that helps now to understand if this world's all there is, then boy, what do you, what do you want to do as far as the world goes, the, the, the planet? Oh, you want to save the planet. Yeah, save the planet. See, and so they have all these causes. It helps you understand. They have save the whales, save the trees, save the snails, you know. <laughs> ad infinitum, ad nauseum. You fill in the blank. They want to save all this, you know, these rare, all this rare stuff. They want to save planet, save Mother Earth. And they have slogans. Their slogans are like, you know, grab all the gusto you can, eat, drink, and be merry, live it up, enjoy today, tomorrow may not come, this is all there is, right? You've heard that before? That's the worldview of natives who think this is it. And by the way, if a person thinks that, then they might as well just do it all, right? Because that's all there is. There's nothing more. And they even are the ones that have the bumper stickers, you know, on their cars that say, the one who, do who, the one who dies with the most toys wins. But you know what they forget? They forget the one who dies with the most toys still dies. Yeah, still dies. See? And they also forget what God says, because they, they don't bother with him, because they either don't believe in him or they're just kind of neutral. But God says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto every person wants to die, but, watch, after this, the judgment. See? So, that worldview, while it is held by thousands of people in this world, probably millions of people, that's false. See? And this world is not all there is. And when a person dies, the moment they die, they go out into eternity and they realize, oops, I was wrong. I was wrong. Now, the second worldview is that of an alien. And that, that word is kind of a politically charged word today, so hang in here with me. What is an alien? Well, an alien is a foreigner who has gone to a foreign country for a purpose. Like, for example, refugees from Kosovo or the Kurds trying to flee Syria for Turkey. It also could be like in the early 1900s, Immigrants from Ireland and Europe who came to America looking for opportunities for themselves and their families. Okay, they're on missions, if you will. Now, for, just forget about, for now, the whole politically charged thing in the news of legal and illegal aliens and all that. Okay, just forget about that. Lay that aside to understand this worldview. What's the worldview, spiritually speaking, of an alien? Okay, spiritually well, in the spiritual context that we're discussing, it's a believer. An alien, or, and that's why I named, put the title, resident alien, is a believer. See, they once were a native, weren't they? Yeah. They were born in sin. 
what happened to them? They came to understand the gospel. They came to understand that Jesus Christ died to save them out of the world system and from the penalty of sin. And so they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they now understand that they are sent on a mission by their homeland. And guess where their homeland is? It's not this world, see. It's heaven. It's the kingdom of God. What did Jesus say about his kingdom? He says, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. See, My kingdom is not of this world. And they're on a mission. What's their mission? The mission is covering the planet, watch, with the good news of the gospel. Now watch, it's not by force, not with power, not by beheading people, see, not like the Islamic jihadists. They are seeking to cover the planet with the good news of the gospel, with the love of God in Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is our king. He's our supreme commander. He's our monarch. And the goal is to convert individual natives from citizens of this world to citizens of heaven. Now, watch this. Every area of an alien's life is dedicated to the king's mission. He walks and talks and eats and sleeps and plans and works to fulfill his assigned purpose to give the gospel to every creature. What did Jesus say right before he left this world? He said, go and give the gospel just to religious people. Is that what it says in the Bible? No. He said, give the gospel to every creature. Now, I know some of you, if you're following closely, like, and, and we have all kinds of people listening to us, uh, some of you are thinking right now, well, Pastor, well, you told us a little bit ago, don't, don't give it to people who aren't interested. Okay, now watch. I said, don't, don't try to force somebody to make a decision for Christ. Don't make, try to give them your smartphone and say, hey, you've got to read this. You can give the gospel to somebody once, and if they have interest, they'll let you know. But here's why I like to use gospel tracts, and most people aren't, in the, sadly, in the habit of doing that today. I like to use gospel tracts because even if the person's not interested, if they'll take it, and most people will, then later on, later on, they may say, hey, uh, the guy gave me something about heaven. And watch this. Nobody's thinking about heaven until somebody in their family just died. Right? Especially when it's a shock, you know, if they died of a heart attack. Or... All of a sudden, they're hitting an accident, and some, and and then all of a sudden, for a moment, then people think about their mortality, don't they? There's a true story of a guy that was a referee years ago, referee for the Har Harlem Globetrotters, and he was suffering with severe depression so much so that in his motel room one night, and this is probably 50 years ago, motel room one night, he had a gun in his pocket. He was going to take his life. That's how depressed he was. The reason, by the way, people take their lives is because they have no, they think they have no hope. That's the reason, okay? No hope. That's it, okay? There's no other, no other reason. And, and if you're a survivor of a suicide, don't blame yourself. You could not have stopped it, all right? That's probably, in my opinion, that's probably the hardest death for survivors to get past because you, you have so many conflicted emotions, you know, you blame yourself, you, and you think, I wish I could have stopped it, I could have done something. Also, then you're angry at the person, why'd you do this to me? By the way, they don't do it to you, they're doing it only for themselves to get out of what they think is an impossible situation, okay? So, that's, that's part of suicide. This guy thought he had no hope, nothing to live for, nobody could help him, reaches in his pocket to pull out the gun, and when he reached in his pocket to pull out the gun, his hand hit a piece of paper. 
The piece of paper was a crumpled up gospel tract that somebody gave him called God's Simple Plan of Salvation, written by Ford Porter years ago. He thought, what's this? He pulled it out and he read it and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and didn't take his life. So that not only saved his physical life, but he gave him eternal life. And probably the person who gave him that track somewhere, maybe weeks before, never ever got to hear about it, but they were doing what God told them to do because God said, give the gospel to every creature. Now, the alien is not deterred or stopped by anything that the world system offers. You see, this world system tries to entice aliens to forsake their allegiance to their homeland. And, and they say, well, you know, don't, don't waste your time with that. If you want to believe that, that's fine. And yet, the Bible's full of examples of aliens who would not defect to the side of the natives. For example, I'll give you three quickly. Moses. Moses. Hebrews 11, 25 and 26 says, Moses chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now here's something that I'll tell young people, and some people don't think you should be honest with young people. I think you should be very honest. So kids, I'll tell you what. There's fun in sin. There's lots of fun in sin. Okay? But you better be sure you get the rest of the message, okay? The Bible says that there's pleasure in sin, watch this, for a short time. See? The fleeting, the fleeting pleasure of sin. And the devil never tells you about the rest of it, see? It's like James 1, 13, 14. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. That's Satan's LSD trip. And there's no good trips on Satan's LSD trip. None. Okay. Every trip ends in death, destruction, hell. Now Moses thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. Hebrews 11, 25 and 26. See, Moses could have stayed in Pharaoh's house, couldn't he? He was the prince of Egypt. He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. So he could have had everything that the world system, one of the richest empires at that time, had to offer, right? But he didn't take it. You know why? He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ. How about the guys in Daniel 3, 16 to 18? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember their story, kids? They were told in that day, everybody has to bow down to the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. It was 90 foot tall. Or else you go in the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow. They did not bow to pressure. And by the way, they worked for him. <laughs> yeah, they worked there. So they were, they were right up front in the crowd. It would be like staffers in the White House, okay? Yeah, seriously. Exactly. And so it was very obvious when they didn't bow. So he calls them up. He says, hey, guys, you know, I saw you didn't bow. Now, you probably didn't understand this. I'm going to give you another chance, you know. And we'll, we'll play the music again. Lawrence, strike up the band, okay? And when you hear the sound of the music, you can bow down, and it'll be off. Pretend we didn't see it the first time. And they said to that temptation. Nebuchadnezzar, we're not needing to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, God whom we serve is able to save us. He'll rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. They weren't going to bow. By the way, what happened when they were thrown in the fiery furnace? 
You should go home and read the story for yourself, Daniel 3. The guards who threw them in the furnace, the guards what got killed by the heat on the outside. The Bible says that the king said, hey, didn't we throw in three guys? Yeah. Well, I see four in there. Watch this. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. See, when you stand for God, Jesus is always with you. Then there's Peter and John who were brought in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin, Acts chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. And they were, they were told, hey, we told you not to preach and teach in this name. So what did Peter say? He said, this is the same Jesus that you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to de release him. You rejected this holy righteous one instead demanded the release of a murderer Barabbas. You killed the author of life. But God raised him up to life and we're witnesses of this fact. The name of Jesus has healed this man. Faith in Jesus caused this healing before your very eyes. Now you need to repent of your sins and turn to God so your sins can be wiped away. Oh, that's pretty bold, isn't it? You say, well, that's all in the Bible. Has anybody since then been willing to take a stand against the, the world system? Sure. Sure. There's a guy I read about, and the story's in the workbook back there that you can read later. Uh, there was a Roman centurion named Vespasian. He led a select band of soldiers. They were known as the emperor's wrestlers. They were picked from the bravest, best of the land, and they were recruited from the athletes in the Roman amphitheater. Because in the Roman amphitheater, they would go and fight for the emperor. And before each contest, they stood before the emperor's throne and they sang, We the wrestlers, wrestling for thee, O emperor, to win for thee the victory, and from thee the victor's crown. Well, the Roman army was sent to fight in Gaul. No soldiers were braver or more loyal than this band of wrestlers that were led by Vespasian. But... When news came, reached Nero, that a lot of Roman soldiers had accepted the Christian faith, then he sent this decree to the centurion Vespasian. By the way, a centurion was a leader of 100 men. And so this was the decree of Nero. If there's any among your soldiers who cling to the faith of the Christian, they must die. Any Christians in your Roman army, I want them killed. Nero said that. So it was the dead of winter. The soldiers were camped on the shore of a frozen lake. Vespasian read the emperor's message. Then he called the soldiers together. And he asked, because he didn't know, Are there any among you who cling to the faith of the Christian? If so, let him step forward. Forty wrestlers. Forty in the band of a hundred. Instantly stepped forward two paces, respectfully saluted, and stood at attention. Their leader paused. He, he didn't know what to do. He hadn't expected so many, and, and not such select ones. Like they were, they were the top soldiers. So he probably pulled a Nebuchadnezzar. He said, well, look, okay, I'll give you till sundown to, for your final answer. Sundown came, and again, he asked the question. And again, the same 40 wrestlers stepped forward. And so the centurion Vespasian pleaded with them long and earnestly to deny their faith. Finally, with, when he saw he couldn't prevail, he said, well, I'm sorry. Nero's decree has to be obeyed, but I'm not going to have your comrades shed your blood. So here's what you're going to need to do. I'm ordering you to march out on the lake of ice and I'll leave you there to the mercy of the elements. They took away their uniforms. They were stripped and then falling into columns of four, those 40 wrestlers marched to the center of the lake of ice. As they marched, they broke into the chant of the arena. Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory, and from thee the victor's crown. Through the night, Vespasian stood by his campfire and watched. And as he waited through the long night, there came to him fainter and fainter the wrestler's song. As morning drew near, one figure, overcome by exposure, crept quietly toward the fire 
In the extremity of his suffering, he had renounced his Lord. Faintly but clearly from the darkness came the song, 39 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory, from thee the victor's crown. The Roman centurion Vespasian looked at the figure drawing close to the fire. Perhaps he saw eternal light shining toward the center of the lake. No one can say, but off came his helmet and clothing, and he sprang out on the ice crying, 40 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory, and from thee the victor's crown. So we have people who have stood for Jesus Christ, no matter what the cost. Those are the aliens. The third worldview is that of a tourist. And sadly, I'm going to tell you before I even explain it to you, this is where the bulk of Christianity is at today. This is where, I didn't say it's where you're at. You, you have to answer this before God. This is where we find the bulk of Christianity today. Because you see, a tourist is an alien without a purpose. An alien without a purpose. While he's in the foreign land, which is this world, he has little or no interest in or loyalty to the homeland where he's a citizen, heaven. Mainly, he wants to see all the sights and sounds and things this foreign country earth, which he's visiting, has to offer. To do this, watch this, he will take whatever time is needed to do it all and spend whatever money is necessary to have it all. Now, he admits or claims to be an alien, a Christian. But his lifestyle most closely parallels, parallels that of a native. So what's the tourist worldview? Well, watch this. The tourist has his life in spiritual compartments, okay? He has his life compartmentalized. And he has a spiritual compartment to his life and so he, he gives God control of the spiritual compartment only of his life. And the Taurus thinks, God has left me totally free to do as I please in all the other areas of my life as long as I'm good. So in other words, he thinks, God doesn't really care how I run my business or do my job as long as I'm not an out-and-out -out crook or the worst of sluggards. It's a job, you know. God doesn't care what I watch on TV as long as I don't participate in the sinful activities I watch. God doesn't care how I spend my free time as long as I behave myself. God doesn't care how I spend my money as long as I don't gamble it away. See, the tourists, they've got this convoluted kind of a, a weird, weird double thinking in their, in their mind. They're double-minded, what James calls a double-minded person. A tourist is happy to acknowledge that God owns everything, but that acknowledgement has no practical impact on the way he uses his money. He still makes all the decisions about how his money is going to be used. In fact, the reason that most churches and ministries all over America struggle to survive financially is because tourists spend about 99% of what they make on themselves and their preferred lifestyle. In fact, if you listen to um, Dave, last name, the guy on TV that does the, uh, the money stuff, <clears throat> I don't feel so bad because nobody else think of it. Again. Thank you, Dave Ramsey, yep. Here's what's more true than my 99% statistic. People spend 110%, 120%, because people spend more than they have on themselves and their lifestyles, don't they? That's why, the, that's why the world's in such debt. That's why people are in such huge debt. In fact, here's what some recent research revealed. If everyone who claims to be a born-again Christian, okay, everyone who claims to be, would just give a tenth of their income, the kingdom of God would have access to an additional, additional $133 billion a year. 
That would be additional. I'm not talking about what's already given. I'm saying if every believer that said they were a believer just gave a tenth. Now, here's how much money that is. If you take one of the largest ministries in America, focus on the family, and that's a huge ministry. That $133 billion annually would entirely fund an additional 1,300 focused on the family-sized ministries. Or we could send an additional 3.3 million missionaries out to the mission fields. 3.3 million. See, every dollar that's needed to completely underwrite the need of every ministry in the world and fulfill the Great Commission is already in the hand of kingdom citizens. The tragedy is that the overwhelming majority is in, of it is in the hand of the tourists who have a totally different mission focus than the king of kings. So the tourist reasons that God doesn't care what I do as long as I don't do anything to embarrass him or his church. Now that, of course, is not true, but that's how a tourist structures his worldview to make any sense out of his tourist lifestyle. So let's just compare a little bit. Here's, what, here's the alien and the tourist. The alien sings, I surrender all, right? And he understands those words to mean all everything. The tourist sings, I surrender all, and he understands those words to mean everything in the spiritual compartment of my life. See? A little bit of my income and an hour or so on Sunday. And with that worldview, the tourist is free to live the vast majority of his life exactly as he or she pleases with little input or interference from God. That allows him to participate and enjoy all the things and activities of the world with no apparent sense of contradiction or feeling of inconsistency. Now, how do they feel about one another, these three worldviews? Well, the native loves and wants the things of the world because in his mind, that's all there is. The native hates the alien. Watch this. The native hates the alien because the alien has always been on changing both him and the culture forever. That's why Jesus said what he did in John 15, 18 to 19. If the world, the cosmos, meaning the natives, hates you, then just know it hated me before it hated you. The native, while he hates the alien, he tolerates the tourist because even though he's an alien, he still anxiously, willingly consumes most all the native's goods and services. So it's good business to keep him around. The tourist, on the other hand, loves and wants the things of the world because he finds immense pleasure in them. But the tourist never really cares about the natives. Now watch this, because this is very convicting. He's more concerned with the food at the restaurant than the native waiter or waitress serving it. The unsaved waiter or waitress serving it, see. He's much more interested in the car on the showroom floor than the unsaved salesman who's selling it. He's more obsessed with winning the game than for the natives on the other team he'll lose. You see the contrast? The alien loves people and uses things to benefit people. The tourist, on the other hand, loves things and uses people to benefit himself. Finally, he feels threatened by the alien because the alien stands as a con constant reminder of his failure to carry out his assigned mission. And so in an attempt to try and justify this failure, they often label these other aliens as radicals, ro holy rollers, or Jesus freaks, you know? <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not one of those Jesus freaks. I'm not one of those fanatics, see? So what's happened, folks? Here's what's happened. The church has slowly moved from being a counterculture in our society to being just one of thousands of subcultures that make up our society. What's a subculture? A subculture is a group of people who want to maintain the distinctives of the group while enjoying the benefits of the larger culture. They're not at all interested in changing the larger culture. They maintain the attitude that says, if you don't hassle us about how we are, we won't hassle you about how you are. For example, the Chinese people in Chinatown in San Francisco are not interested in making Denver Chinese, but likewise, they don't want Denver to force them to use American laundries. The Polish section of Chicago is not interested in making Indianapolis Polish, but they don't want Indianapolis to insist they stop eating their Polish sausage. But unlike these foreign cultures who brought their distinctives with them, 
We Christians, for the most part, have simply modified the world's culture and Christianized it and now claim it's different. So we have Christian TV networks and Christian books and magazines and Christian softball leagues and Christian radio stations and Christian rock and roll and Christian psychology and Christian entertainers. And all we've done is merely take the existing worldly culture and activities and modified them just enough to say they're different from the world's while we leave the bulk of it the same. And if we would be totally honest with ourselves, the changes we have made are really more window dressing than reality. What's a counterculture? A counterculture is a group of people whose sole objective is to change the existing larger culture and replace it with distinctives of their own counterculture. Now, some of you remember the teenage hippie rebellion in the 60s. That's a perfect example of a counterculture. They were not satisfied with just breaking from traditional culture and having free love drugs and anti-war sit-ins. They wanted to bring the whole cultural structure down wanted everyone to adopt their countercultural lifestyles and values. To a very great extent, sadly, they succeeded. The best example, though, of an effective counterculture is found right where you might expect to find it, the handbook for aliens, the Bible. In Acts 17, here's what they said about Paul and his men after they went and for three Sabbath days reasoned with people out of the Scriptures. It says some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. When they couldn't find these men, to, they began dragging Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting this, These men who have upset the world have come here also. King James says it like this, These that have turned the world upside down are come here also. You see, Paul wasn't coming to Thessalonica to fit in with the community and become a respectable citizen of their fair town. He didn't come to Thessalonica to see the sights. He was there for one reason, and one reason only, to change that city and culture for Christ. And following that commission, he was turning the world upside down. His countercultural revolution was working. And I submit that the same exact countercultural revolution initiated by Paul would still work today if we had the courage to employ it. The tragedy, though, is as one author has put it, the church, in trying to lean over and relate to the world, has fallen in. Fallen in. Our churches are full of tourists who profess to be aliens, but who still live the lifestyle of the natives. And that's why the church in America, which should be shaking this country to its foundations for Christ, is sadly enough having a relatively minor impact in the life and affairs of America. Our enemies certainly would never accuse us, as Paul was, of turning the natives upside down for Christ. Now, when I was teaching at Mount Lucian Bible Camp back in the 70s, I gave this illustration. I said, Jesus Christ has put the church in the world. So we're like a boat, okay? The world's the water. And Jesus put the church, the boat, in the water, the world. And we're here to make an impact. We're here to make disciples of Christ. We're here to have a witness. The devil's turned around, and he's put the water, the world, in the boat. And I said to the kids I was teaching, like 10, 11, 12-year-olds, I said, what happens when you get water in a boat? This one little kid goes, He says, it sinks, man. I said, yeah, you got it. And sadly, spiritually, metaphorically speaking, that's what's happening to church today. The church is sinking because there's too much of the water, say, in the boat. Now, we are not on this planet to just peacefully coexist with the natives. We are here on this planet to capture the planet for the commander-in-chief of our homeland. We are called to make aliens out of the natives. And to that end and that end alone, we've been called. And I close with this verse. Paul, write this scripture down, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Paul said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us, 
He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20. So where do you find yourself this morning? Are you a native? Are you an alien? Are you a tourist? Where would you like to be? That's in your hands. Let's bow our heads, please, for prayer. Now, if you, if you do not know that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. If you do not know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, that you have eternal life, but you'd like to know, you say, I would like to know that. I don't know it right now, but I'd like to know it. I'd like to help you to know that. You can pray this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Just pray this prayer silently from your heart to God. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. I invite him now to come into my life, forgive my sin, give me eternal life, a new life in Christ. Thank you for hearing my prayer and saving me. Help me now to live my life for you and fulfill your mission to reach people for Christ. Help me not to be ashamed of you. Help me to tell someone else of what I've done today. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer a minute, God heard you and he saved you today. I'd like to thank him for saving you. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you'd let me pray and thank God for saving you today, would you lift your hand right now? And by the raised hand, you're just saying, yes, today for the first time, I invited Jesus Christ into my life to forgive my sins and save me. And I today am happy to confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I asked him to be today, and he heard my prayer. Would you lift your hand up right now if you pray that prayer in a minute? I'm not going to embarrass you. I just thank God for saving you. Christian friend, let me ask you a question. If you're a believer, that means that you're no longer a native. However, do you find yourself as an alien? Can you honestly say the song that I'm going to close with? This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Or do you find yourself a tourist? Enjoying the sights and sounds of the world. Saying, I'll worry about heaven when I get there. Are you on a mission for the Lord? You don't need to be a preacher to be on a mission. Just be a Christian. I wonder how many believers would say today, Pastor Bill, God's Holy Spirit spoken to me. And I need today to make some changes in my life as a Christian. Here's my hand, pray for me. Yes, God bless you and you. Anyone else? That's what I need to do, yep, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us, that you love us. Thank you that you want to use us for you. Help us to be willing to put you in charge and allow you to run our lives so that we will be resident aliens looking to you for our orders and help us to reach people for you because we're obeying the orders of our commander the Lord Jesus Christ in his name I pray with thanksgiving amen